so Friday, uh, I got this bright idea that um, I was going to reorganize my garage. And it was a cooler day than it had been, so I thought I'd go out there and do this stuff. And what I learned along the way was there, there were several things up in this project that were probably large enough that I should not have done it by myself. Uh, but pride or wanting to surprise my wife when she gets home and it be nice and neat kind of got in the way. And uh, in the midst of all of that, even, it all kind of started with we got a refrigerator last week. And we've been debating about what to do with the old one. Uh, I've never had a second refrigerator, but we had some space in the garage. I thought, yeah, it'd be handy from time to time. And so I went down to the uh, what used to be Ada Sales and Rentals, whatever it is now, and I rented a utility dolly to take my old refrigerator out uh, the front door and around and into the garage. And I went down there about 3 o'clock, got this dolly, and I've used one from U-Haul before. I thought I knew what I was doing, and I thought, well, this will be simple enough they, if you don't understand the principle of it, it basically has this big strap that goes around whatever you, appliance you're going to move, and that helps you to secure it, and theoretically, with one person, you can do this thing. And the U-Haul ones are low-tech enough that you just pull that strap around and run it through almost like a belt loop kind of thing, tighten it up as best you can. What I found when I got home with the one from Ada Sales or Oki Rents, that's what it is now, uh, from Oki Rents, is it has like this little ratcheting thing on it and it's all automatic and it kind of it wants to come back together and you have to force it to come apart and as I forced it apart what I learned pretty quickly was whatever holds it in place so you can wrap it around the refrigerator is not working and so it as soon as you pull it out and stretch it out it just wants to zip back in and very quickly by the way and, and so I'm trying to figure out how am I going to do this and I'm thinking what do I own that's the right size to wedge in this place to to make it stop and finally I figured something out I could do and you could have seen me this would have been entertaining by the way to watch me wrestling with this thing for probably about 15 minutes and I finally figured out how to get the ratchets to stop long enough to get it around and to clamp it on and I'm ready to go and as soon as I get it back the straps release, and they're both flying at me at a high rate of speed with little metal buckles on the end of it, and I thought, I'm not sure what sort of injury I'm going to get from this, but it's not going to be good, and I have the refrigerator up off the ground at this point, and I have a lot of decisions to make now very quickly of what am I going to do? Am I going to give up? Am I going to keep this, this utility dollar over the weekend and pay more for it, uh, or am I going to just go and see what happens, and that's, that's what I ended up with, and I, I start pulling this thing out the door, and, and it rocked a little bit, but luckily, I didn't tell my wife any of this until just now, by the way. Uh, she just knows the fridge is there, has no idea the excitement that went into it. Uh, luckily, I made it to the garage, uh, everything went fine, uh, everything's in one piece, including me, which is good, but it's this thing that I have about what we're talking about tonight, independence. I, from, you know, somewhere early on in life when you're two years old and you get in that thing where you, you want to do it yourself, and there are a lot of parents and grandparents that have probably heard this along the way, and most of us have said it somewhere along the way, I don't know that I ever fully let go of that. Uh, I think a lot of us, if we're honest with ourselves, have a pretty good bit of that where we don't want to ask for help when it comes to simple things of the world where maybe it's a two-man or a three-man project and we just rather kind of do it ourselves. Unfortunately, as Christians, a lot of us have gotten in this mode with God, where we just feel like, okay, if things get completely out of control and nothing is working, then maybe I'll turn to God. But in the beginning, I, I should be capable of doing this on my own. And that is a mistaken path to, to head down. Uh, and what you will find is it leads to a lot of uh, frustration and sometimes heartache. And it's one of those things that we know better, and yet how often do we find ourselves there? So as we are this weekend thinking about independence within our world, I want us to see a little bit of what it looks like when we're trying to do this as Christians and why it just doesn't really work the way it should. Now, we will not start with definitions on all of these, but I, I've looked them up every time, and every now and then they will hit in such a way where it, it's too good to pass up, and this is one of those. Uh, the definitions of independent, according to Webster, uh, and there, there were three or four more, but these I really like these. Not subject to control by others. Or, or in our case as Christians, maybe sometimes not subject to control by another who is above us. Not affiliated by a lar uh, with a larger controlling unit. So a lot of people will try to, to follow Christ and to be followers of God, but they don't want to get too involved in church because th there's like this thing here that we're all a part of. 
not requiring or relying on something else. So we like to be self-reliant. That's kind of an American value. Uh, not looking to others for one's opinions or for guidance in conduct. Uh, in this case for us, maybe not looking to God for those things. And then fifth, not requiring or relying on others. So there's a lot here that we see that I hope maybe you're put off by some of these ideas because when we look at these definitions, they are all antithetical to the Christian walk. These are all the opposite of who God has called us to be. We are supposed to be people who are not not reliant. We're supposed to be people who are reliant. We're not supposed to be independent of God, but dependent on him instead. In Colossians 2 and verse 8, Paul says this, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. Now, I would submit to you in, in the Christian sense, this thing that has been drilled into us that we can do it ourselves, we're supposed to be independent. I remember when we first moved to Oregon, one of the things that one of the church members told us was in Oregon they have this, this independent spirit, this rugged individualism that kind of came from you know, years ago when people went out west and they, they were conquering something new and being in a, a rugged place and it taught them to be kind of self-sufficient. I feel like that's a philosophy and empty deceit kind of thing, that we have been taught that we can handle these things all on our own. According to human tradition, and that's another thing here for us in America, we, we celebrate independence, and I, I get that, but when we try to bring that into our Christian walk, we probably miss out on a lot of things that are important. According to the elemental spirits of the world, so I believe, honestly, that this is one of those places that Satan likes to work on us too. That he tries to tell us, you know, you, you can handle this without God. Go all the way back to the garden. God, God doesn't want you to be like him. God's holding back on you is the, the kind of terminology we would get today. And so he gets into our minds that we can handle these things on our own. And then not according to Christ. Because this is not the way that Jesus taught or the way that Jesus lived. So do not be taken captive by independence. Sounds kind of backwards, doesn't it? Yep, but for us as Christians... This is pretty much what we struggle with a lot of the time. We, we want to figure this out, do it on our own. So what kind of people embrace dependence on God? And I think we find stories of lots of people like this within, uh, like this within Scripture, that because of the circumstances of life or, or the things they believe, they are willing to embrace being dependent on God. Uh, first of all, people in difficult circumstances. Now, this for us usually is the easy one to see. When, when things are so stripped away, things are so difficult that we don't know where else to turn, it's easier for us to turn to God. The key for us is probably to turn there before we get to that point. The psalmist in Psalm 18 verse 6 says, In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. We don't cry out a whole lot nowadays, or at least we try not to, but usually when we do, it's we're kind of at the end of our rope, and we cry out. So the psalmist here talks about crying out to God. And then in Psalm 116, verse 6, he says, The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. So there are times where we feel like we're kind of riding high, and here the psalmist talks about a time where he is brought low. He, he is, we might think, at rock bottom or at the end of his rope or however, whatever terminology you might use. But the psalmist understands where he is and the fact that he needs God. Or in the New Testament, uh, the disciples are out on the boat, the storm has come up, they are upset, scared, everything else, and Jesus is sleeping. And they find him in Luke chapter 8, verse 24, it says, they went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. I, I love the story of the stilling of the storm, but in our Gospels, it's pretty short. It it's not that many verses. And I've often wondered at what point did they wake him? You know, what was the time that had passed? What things had they tried first? And are, are you like this at times where you're going to try this and you're going to try that and you're going to try that and if none of those things work, then eventually you're going to go finally do something about it. Uh, we, we do that with, with medical things. We do that with, uh, you ever get a toothache and you think, well, maybe it'll go away. Does it ever go away? It doesn't, does it? You know, it always just kind of gets worse and worse, and then you finally have to do something. Spiritually, we don't need to be that. So these disciples, I'm going to guess, as some of them being fishermen, probably do the things that fishermen do when storms come along to try to make it better. And at some point, they realize it's not going to be, and they go to the only one who can help them, 
So when they're in this difficult circumstance, they know to go to Jesus. Secondly, uh, people who acknowledge their weakness. This is another thing as uh, Americans in 2024, we, we don't like to do this. We don't like to admit we can't figure this out. Now, the smarter version of Brian would have picked up the phone and called Oki Rents and said, hey, I, I'm trying to get this strap to go around and it keeps ratcheting back in and I don't know how to make it stop. What do I need to do? But I had already told the guy as I loaded it into my car, yeah, I know how these work. And I knew that if I called back, I would have to admit, no, I, I really, I, I know how the cheap U-Haul one works. I don't know how this one works. Help, please. But I didn't want to do that. So I tried everything I could think of first and thought I figured it out and hadn't quite gotten there. Are we willing to admit weakness? Are we willing to admit we don't have all the answers? We don't know the way to do things all the time. We don't always have the self-sufficiency that we think we have. In Romans 5 and verse 6, Paul says, while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. So while we were in a state where we were too weak to do something about it ourselves, Christ dies for us. And in Romans 7, 18, he says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. And how often have we been there? You know the right thing to do, you know what you should not do, and you find yourself doing the opposite of what you want to do. It's that desire to do it on your own that is never going to be, it's never going to get you there. You have to be able to rely on God, to rely on one another. Uh, third, uh, people who trust in God. And this, if you get nothing else tonight, I hope maybe you will hone in on this. We feel like when we're being independent, we, we feel like when we're trying to do things on our own that we are pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps, that we are uh, working hard, that we're doing all the right things. And what we don't realize sometimes is what we're communicating to God when we do those things is, I do not trust you with this. We would never say it in those words, would we? I mean, we, we would never in the midst of a prayer say to God, I don't trust you. But yet so often our actions and the way we go about when we talk to him and bring things to him, they communicate that. And instead, we need to be people who trust in God. In Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, the wise man says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. So you're trusting with all your heart, acknowledging in all your ways, not leaning on your understanding. You're showing trust in him through your willingness to be dependent on him. In Psalm 62 and verse 8, the psalmist says, Trust in him at all times. Boy, there are some times where it's, it's easy to do that, aren't there? And there are other times where it's just hard to let go of control. We have so many things like that in life, if you're anything like me, that, that you just don't want to fully let go of control. And yet when it comes to God, God is asking us to release those things to him. Oh, people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Fourth, people who understand we are not self-sufficient. And again, for us nowadays... That is a difficult thing to admit because we want to feel like we can take care of all those things on our own. And yet God shows us something very different. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 4 and 5, Paul says, Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. I, I love in Paul's writings how often he makes it clear that he is not enough on his own. It is not about him and what he can do. And I, I keep looking at Paul thinking, here, here is a person who, to the point of death and imprisonment, is able to stand firm, and yet over and over again says, it's not me. It's not my strength. It's not my knowledge. It's not what I do. All of this comes from God. And if Paul can see that in his own life, shouldn't we be able to see that in ours? Yeah, I, I would imagine Paul probably knows a little more Scripture than I do. I may have degrees that, uh, that Paul didn't have because that wasn't his day and time, but I wouldn't want to get in a Bible Bowl contest with Paul. Pa Paul knows his scripture. I would imagine Paul has proven himself in difficult circumstances much more than I have. And yet sometimes I will convince myself that I don't need anybody else or, or that I don't need God's help in these things. And Paul reminds us, yes, you do. You do need God's help. In Psalm 102, Sorry, in Psalm 102, verse 101, the psalmist says, Hear my prayer, O Lord, let my cry come to you. So again, this, this language of cries, I'm crying out to God. And in Luke 18, uh, verses 16 and 17, Jesus called to them, 
and we have seen this, this verse about the children so many times, and I have heard, I don't know, probably 20 sermons about it at this point where different preachers have explained what it means to be like a child. It, it has kind of struck me in the midst of all this that maybe there's a piece of it we've missed. He said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. <clears throat> now with a new grandchild in our world, I find myself seeing babies and children a little differently than I did six weeks ago. Uh, as he has been at our house a lot uh, over the last several weeks, and it's really kind of cool, I, I have noticed that he's pretty dependent on everybody. And, and I know he's really small, and he'll get mobile at some point, and he'll start to figure the world out and all of that. But for right now, there are moments where you're feeding him the bottle, and he wants it too quickly. And you have to stop the bottle and put it down and pick him up and burp him. And, you're, you know, I, I don't need help burping nowadays. Uh, and yet for him, you, you've got to sit there and you've got to pat. And then finally that thing comes around. And then you can go back to the bottle again. And in the midst of all of it, he's kind of annoyed with you because he wants the bottle back. And yet he is dependent on you to know what is better. And then kids, as you begin to grow, there are still things that you are dependent on others for, dependent on parents and adults and then at some point along the way, we become adults and we feel like we have shaken all of that. And yet, in the eyes of God, maybe part of becoming like a child is this. Is it that we need to recognize that we are dependent on him as our father? So it's not just about the innocence and not just about the wonder and all of the various things you hear about kids, but it's also the acknowledgement that we, we need him to get through this life. And then people who want to be like Jesus. I am struck by, if we don't see enough of it in Paul, in all of the wonderful things that he did, and the fact that he still sees it's not him and that he's not enough, we also see from Jesus this dependence on the Father. As we looked at this morning, right before he is uh, tempted in the wilderness by Satan, it says in Luke chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. And we almost pass over the words because we're looking at wilderness and spirit and all of these things and thinking about the temptation that's coming, but he was led. Jesus, the Son of God in the flesh, who John tells us has been here from before the world began, who has seen everything that has happened, who is part of creation, was led. And if he can be led, why could I not be led? Or why could you not be led? Why can we not be dependent on God? In Luke 5 and verse 16, it says that he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Doesn't he already have all the answers? Doesn't he already know everything there is to know? Wasn't he already there to see all of it? And yet he still felt like there was a need for connection with God. In John chapter 5, in verse 30, he just says it outright. When his authority is being questioned, he's, he's healed the man that he asked, do you want to be well earlier in the chapter? And everybody's wondering about this and how it happened and why and where he gets the power. And he says in verse 30, I can do nothing on my own. There's a memory verse for you. Maybe that's something we need to wake up each morning thinking. I can do nothing on my own, dependent on the Father. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So I can do nothing on my own, and I'm seeking his will, not mine. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. We are looking to God, not to ourselves. Uh, <clears throat> in the book Holiness Day by Day, the author describes dependence this way. Dependence is not simply one of a list of several disciplines. Rather, it gives life and vitality to all of them. Just as the principle of life that makes the seed grow gives fruition to all the farmer's efforts, so the enabling of the Holy Spirit within us gives fruition to our disciplines. Dependence on the Holy Spirit should permeate them all. So when we think about the ones we have talked about so far on Sunday mornings, uh, about meditation and about prayer and this morning about fasting, they're all about dependence on God. And if dependence becomes a regular part of who we are, then all of these disciplines begin to, to work in a better way, in the way that God designed for them to be. So dependence on God is true freedom. 
in, as we think about independence this weekend, to have independence, to have freedom in the eyes of God comes in a very different way than we sometimes think it would. Paul in Romans chapter 8, uh, starting in verse 1, says, There is now, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So don't, don't hear me wrong that being dependent on God is not freedom. It's exactly what freedom is supposed to look like for us. We are freed from all of the other things that we have been bonded to, and instead we latch ourselves to God. In Galatians 5, starting in verse 1, Paul says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And then verse 13, he says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So this independence we have when it comes to sin is so we can serve each other, be dependent on him, and also be dependent on one another as a church family. And then back in Romans 8, he says, so then, brothers, we are debtors, or we are dependent, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So what are you dependent on? I think as much as we feel like we are independent nowadays, there's something. There's something that we rely on. And it's interesting, when you look throughout Scripture, there's so many different themes you can find. But I think one that you'll see quite a bit is people who, who feel like they want to be independent of something and then just choose another thing to be dependent to. You look at God's people in Egypt and they're slaves and they cry out to God and God hears their cries and they're freed and God wants them to be dependent on Him instead of the, the people who were their slave owners back in Egypt and they keep reminiscing back to what they felt like were better days because the wilderness is so hard. And then when they don't know exactly what God is up to, they, they fashion idols of their own and they become dependent on those. And God's people are up and down throughout Scripture with the idea of a God who wants them to be dependent on Him and instead they choose something else. And if you struggle with the idea of dependence, my guess would be there's probably something in your life that you're dependent on and you may not even realize it. And God would say to you, just be dependent on me instead. Call on me first. And you will find that as you are willing to be dependent on him, so many of the other things will begin to fall into place. If you have never been baptized into him, it is salvation. It is so many things. But one of the things that is a statement of is, I am dependent on you. I am dependent on God for what he will do in our lives. I'm dependent on God for what he has already done. And if you have walked away from that, if you have chosen instead to be independent of him, know that he wants you back, that he wants you to come back to him and be dependent on him again. Tonight, if we can help you in some way, we want you to be dependent on us and we want to depend on you as brothers and sisters. But most of all, we want you to go back to him in whatever way you need to. If we can help in some way, please come while we stand and sing.